morning. Welcome to Lincoln Theater. My name is Christina Belknap and I'm the executive director here and I'm so thrilled to see so many of you for the first event in our new series, Talking Aquaculture in Maine. Uh, I want to thank the Island Institute for partnering with us on putting this together. We couldn't have done it without them. Uh, they have brought our hosts and worked out our guests, and I'm so appreciative that they were on board with bringing this uh, series to our community. Also, thank you to the Shuck Station. Uh, they're one of our sponsors for the event. And tonight, your host is the Senior Ocean Scientist and Director of the Center for Climate and Community. And her name is Susie Arnold. <laughs> and we have our postcards in the lobby that'll give you the next events that are coming up. So if you don't have one of those, please grab one on your way out. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you so much for partnering with us on this event. And we're really looking forward to tonight and then two more um, sessions like this to talk about aquaculture here in Maine. So um, as Christina said, my name is Susie. I'll be the, the host of today's event. We have three amazing panelists that I am so excited to sit up here for the next hour and hour and a half. Uh, we're going to actually kick it off before I introduce the panelists to you. We're going to start with a short film that was filmed and produced by Atlantic Sea Farms. Um, one of our panelists works at Atlantic Sea Farms. It's a three minute and 24 second film, so it will be relatively short, but it will give you a visual, if you're not already familiar with kelp farming in Maine, it will give you a visual of what that looks like and some of the key players that we have here in Maine. So without further ado, I'll start this, this video and then I'll introduce our panelists. When I was six years of age, I started with my dad sterning on the back of his boat. I've lobstered for 60 years. I've been a commercial lobster fisherman for over 25 years. If somebody told me 20 years ago that I was going to be growing kelp, I'd have probably told them they was crazy. I would have said to them they're crazy. No. Never thought, never thought that would happen, <laughs> yeah. It was definitely not on my horizon. I had no idea what kelp did. I didn't know that I was gonna be doing something good for the ocean. You know, I didn't know that at first. It's so hard today to see what the future's gonna be as far as anything to do with the fishing industry. Climate change and stuff does definitely scare me. I've always had alternative fisheries. Just in case something happens to the lobster fishery. I personally never ate kelp before I started growing it. And we all eat kelp now, my whole family. It's delicious, it really is. There's a certain reward in supplying food for people. You started it, you saw it through, and now somebody's gonna eat that. I think it gives my children a much greater appreciation for where things come from. I've really been amazed by how much it really benefits the environment. We don't use fertilizers, we don't need water. Everything is there and it's 100% natural. It's Mother Nature. She's the kelp farmer. That one little thing is like the deed that I do to kind of help give back to the planet. Because I know what climate change is doing to the ocean. If we reverse just a teeny tiny bit of that by growing seaweed, I'll do it. It's good for the environment. It's good to provide a great food source. But it fits into my business in the sense that I get paid to do that. I'm doing something good for the ocean. <laughs> Which does something good for me. Gives me a paycheck. But spending time with my dad is probably the best part. 
I just like spending time with my dad, to be able to watch and learn. He's a big role model of mine. I feel very fortunate to be able to work with my family. Safety for my children. I gotta look forward. I feel hopeful. It's kind of a no-brainer to grow seaweed and the ocean will be better for it. Okay, I'd like to invite our panelists up. So Keith Miller, Liz McDonald, and Nicole Price, if you could join me up here. Keith, you may recognize from the video. Probably the happiest kelp farmer I've ever met. <laughs> Have a seat anywhere. Probably the last three chairs would be good. Looks like they have us drinking beer up here, so I'll try to keep it under control. <laughs> so I was going to give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves just for a minute, um, and then I'm going to tell a little story about how I met each of these people. So Nicole, I'll let you start. Sure. My name's Nicole Price. Can you all hear me? I have a soft voice. Okay. <laughs> I'm a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences out in East Booth Bay. I've been there for about nine years. I also direct our Center for Seafood Solutions, and I have a dual appointment at the Colby College in the Environmental Studies Depart Department. Hi, I'm Liz McDonald. I am the Seaweed Supply Director at Atlantic Sea Farms, and I am fortunate enough to get to work with the wonderful farmers up and down the coast of Maine, like Keith. Um, so I work primarily helping with lease acquisitions, aquaculture advocacy, um, oversee all of our harvest, and work in the ocean space with our farmers. Hey, you know, I'm Keith Miller. I am a, as you hear, a aquaculturist and a lobsterman also, two, two work fields. Keith, will you tell us a little bit about um, other fisheries you might have been involved in in your life? Um, back in the 90s, I was involved in the urchin trade. Mm -hmm. Um, we took divers out, mm -hmm. and actually back in the middle 80s, I was in the shrimping business. I actually rigged the boat over to uh, drag for shrimp, and uh, both of them been depleted. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd share a little bit of a uh, personal story for each of these folks. Um, so Nicole and I both ironically studied coral reef ecology in graduate school, so knew each other. I was in Maine, she was based in California. Um, and then she got a job at Bigelow, and uh, we went out for ice cream to just kind of catch up and discovered we both had an interest in seaweed farming and its potential to remediate ocean acidification. And that was how many years ago now have you been at? Nine. Nine years, nine. yeah. So we've been working together here in Maine, um, her at Bigelow, me at the Island Institute, for nine years now. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here on the stage with me, Nicole. Very um, happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, Liz, we've only met more recently in the last year. Our paths have crossed through Atlantic Sea Farms. Um, I first started working with Atlantic Sea Farms um, back with Nicole when Paul Dobbins was one of the first kelp farmers in Maine. He ran a company called Oceans Approved. And Nicole and I did research on uh, the farm off of Shabig, which was the, the country's first kelp farm. Um, at, at the time, a woman named Brianna Warner worked at the Island Institute. She was our economic development director. Brianna is now the CEO of Atlantic Sea Farms. Ocean Approved turned into Atlantic Sea Farms. Brianna took over from Paul, and Liz now works with Bri at Atlantic Sea Farms. And um, so that's how I got to know Liz. And Keith was a participant in the Island Institute's business to, aquaculture business development program. That was a program that we ran at the Island Institute for four years to help people who make their current livings off of the water, mostly lobstermen, diversify into something else, um, and that something else was shellfish or seaweed aquaculture. And Keith, you were in our 2017 cohort. Right. I remember the first time you came to the Island Institute. You probably don't remember, but I do, because you have <laughs> a, quite a presence. I remember you coming up with, I think, maybe with Scott, all three of the, the people in that video. <coughs> Scott, we were all involved. Yep, Keith. Yep. And Karen Cooper all went through the aquaculture yes. business development program, so I got to know them um, through that program, and that's how I met I met Keith and Sam Belknap, who's here in the room. I think he helped you with some of your uh, your mapping and your and your lease work. He did. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's how I met Keith back in 2017, 
And it's been a pleasure to, to watch the trajectory of his business, um, and he'll be able to tell you more about that. Uh, so I wanted to start with just some questions from me <coughs> that I'll direct to the panel, and we'll go till probably about um, 7.50 with conversation up on the stage. And then I'd like to open it up to you all to ask questions of the panel. And so we can, we can do that for, for about uh, 20 or 30 minutes. So I'm sure I won't get out all the questions, and there will probably be many. So um, something I wanted to start for all the panelists with was around the motivation behind your work. So we'll just start with Nicole since we'll go in order here. But so Nicole, I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about what motiv motivated you to begin to study seaweed. Right, so Susie and I both studied something kind of similar in graduate school. We were looking at the ability for corals to recruit or build reefs. And the newest area of research that was becoming a hot topic was ocean acidification and how it was going to threaten coral reefs' ability to build their skeletons. And so I was doing a lot of experiments comparing the ability for corals and other calcified shell building <coughs> organisms to survive under these conditions against what happens to fleshy seaweeds when they're provided with excess carbon dioxide, which causes the acidification process. And we kept running into a problem where every time we tried to set up an experiment, the treatments would get ruined because the seaweed kept sucking up all the carbon dioxide over and over again. <laughs> We'd have to bubble more and more in and running out of CO2 tanks. And finally I said, well, wait a second. Maybe this offers maybe a problem for my research, but a solution that could be meaningful to coastal communities. And what better place to study the power of seaweed to suck up CO2 and remediate ocean acidification than the birthplace of seaweed farming or kelp farming in the US, and that's Maine. And so that's what drew me out to Maine, away from California, and, and that line of research is exactly why Bigelow felt to me like the right place to start making those inquiries and partnering some, with somebody like Susie and Island Institute who was already entering into this aquaculture space to make the right introductions to folks like Paul Dobbins and others. That's how I got there. Thank you. <laughs> and Liz, I was wondering if you could share with the crowd what motivated you to begin to work for a vertically integrated seaweed company in Maine. It's kind of unique. It's definitely unique in the way that we're almost five businesses in one, but the primary part of the business is, is the farming. Without that, none of the other pieces would be there. And so Brianna Warner was the person who realized, okay, we need to work with fishermen. And that's really where the appeal for me came to, to work at Atlantic Sea Farms. I'm part of a fishing family. My husband is a commercial lobsterman. I've been working in the aquaculture industry on the water since 2016. And I started in mussels, actually, mussels, and then did initially um, some of the first scallop farming in Maine. And then we added kelp to that. And I really saw a lot of potential there. Um, there's a lot of women that are finding their role in the marine industries in seaweed. And that was the place that spoke to me being the only woman on the entire crew of the boats that I worked on in the harbors that I was in. And um, I was able to go from industry, work on some research projects with the Department of Energy and do nursery and farming, and really wanted to get back to industry. Uh, and Atlantic Sea Farms was the place where I could work with fishermen, I could work with food, I could work with seaweed, and I could work for a really accomplished woman who I respect, and that's why I'm here. Awesome. Yeah. So Keith, you alluded to it a little bit in the video, but I was wondering if you could share with us what motivated you to get into <coughs> kelp farming as a lobsterman. Well, believe it or not, one motivation factor was my mother-in-law, who worked at the Institute, Diane Perry. Oh, yeah. And she was telling me of the programs that they That's had right. coming up, yeah. and that started it. And then with lobstering being so unpredictable, I needed something more stable in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, we're losing our season. Our season continues to get shorter, and the catch moves offshore into the deeper water. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for something, stability, mm -hmm. that, that you know we could produce. Um, I didn't look at it being this big, no. When I first started with Paul Dobbins, we raised 4,500 pounds, 
and I think I was one of the first ones that actually raised kelp for him mm -hmm. when he first started. And like I say, there's mushroom from there. And where we end up, I really don't know. We're just pushing the envelope and keep on going. Yeah, I forgot to tell everybody what Keith's <clears throat> nickname is, which is the King of Kelp. <laughs> 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 yeah. He got that name. I'm just going to say yeah. it because I don't know if you'll say it, Keith, but Keith grew more kelp than anybody else in the entire country last year. Wow. It was, it was, it, it's just like fishing. It, most of it was the environment. You, everything has to work right. And Mother Nature has to work right with us like it does the farmer or anything like that. And last year it worked right, and this year it did just the opposite. It worked in the wrong direction. And Liz and I, are, you know, we're on the panel to try to figure this out, and where do we lead on to get the proper kelp to grow in this wild climate? And uh, we're, we're facing some challenges, but we'll, we'll work it out. We will. We know we will. We'll come up with something. So. How much do you grow? 170,000 pounds. Woo! <laughs> awesome. So we hear a lot about the superpowers of seaweed. So I was hoping that, Nicole, you could explain why, why people say that. Um, what are some of the environmental benefits of farming kelp? Uh, what do we know and what are we still learning? And, and could you shed some light on some of that? We, we talked about ocean acidification remediation, but there are also um, um, nutrient removal properties and other environmental benefits that people talk about. Uh, and you are the leading expert in the state on that topic, so I was hoping you could, you could set us straight and tell us what we know and what we're still learning more about. How long do we have again? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I want to actually start by saying that all farmers, be they land farmers or ocean farmers, are scientists at heart. The, the same kinds of questions that Keith is asking himself about how to increase yields, they're the same kinds of questions that we ask about how can you get different kinds of ecosystem services out of an organism. It's, it's all the same set of questions. So some of those questions that we're asking about now is, we know that kelp is a pretty good sponge. Well, how good of a sponge is it? How much carbon dioxide can it remove from the ocean or even remove directly from the atmosphere through that top layer of seawater? How much nitrogen and phosphorus that we're letting run into our ocean waters via runoff or wastewater treatment plants can be, how much of that can be absorbed by the kelp and then taken out of this, the ocean and put back into our agricultural systems via a fertilizer? Once we've grown that kelp and we've harvested it, how can we use it in various supply chains that allows for um, an ingredient or a step that has a much lower carbon footprint than others that are based on fossil fuels, plastics, what have you. So th those, that's sort of the line of inquiry that we're asking and, and some of that uh, through the Center for Seafood Solutions, and I say we very purposefully, there's dozens of scientists at Bigelow who are working on some of these questions. And then we have lots of partners throughout the Northeast region at lots of different we're partnering with about 13 institutions now to start to tackle some of these questions. So um, we are learning that, yes, kelp is quite efficient at removing CO2, and you can, in, in, effect, in effect, measure that in the seawater. You can look at um, increased water quality right in the area around the kelp where the oxygen content is higher, the carbon dioxide content is lower, and the nitrogen and phosphorus content is lower, too. Is it enough to... Uh, not worry about wastewater treatment and, and trying to elevate what we have now on land. No, it's not enough to fix all of those problems, but it's enough to make a dent. Is it enough to address climate change? M maybe, but it's a very cautious maybe, because once that carbon is captured within the kelp <coughs> tissue, if you feed it to us or you feed it to an animal, we exhale and breathe back out that carbon as carbon dioxide. So it's not taking it out of the global carbon cycle, unless, two things, unless it's sunken or removed in a way so that it's out of the carbon cycle and at depths low enough um, in the ocean layer that it doesn't get circulated back up, or in marine sediments where you have some surety that's been captured and stays there durably or permanently or measurably. 
that's the trick right now, is developing measurement and reporting and verification tools to ensure that once it goes down below 1,000 meters or into sediments, that it stays there. We don't have that assurance quite yet. We're trying to get there, but we, we are still developing the tools to make those measurements. We also want to make sure that there's no unintended impacts by putting a lot of biomass low down in the ocean or in sediments. <laughs> I would argue that there's actually quicker ways to addressing climate change mitigation by putting the seaweed biomass into a supply chain and reducing CO2 emissions somewhere else. Namely, we're really interested in feeding kelp or other seaweed species to livestock, namely dairy cattle, and it could be fed to beef livestock as well, to reduce their methane burps. So you might think that the methane or the gas that these animals are producing comes out the back end. It mostly comes out the front end, actually, and it's part of their natural digestion process. But the seaweed has some bioactive compounds in it that disrupt the microbiota of that front um, part of the, the ruminant stomach and thus reduces the methane burps without changing anything about the cow's natural behavior or its ability to produce milk or beef. <clears throat> and in fact, may increase yields of both of those things. Why am I really interested in this process? Because it puts money in the pockets of the seaweed farmer and money in the pockets of the dairy farmer allows both of them to potentially access <coughs> carbon credits and feel really good about what they're doing for the environment but it has maybe even the larger impact than sinking the seaweed and targeting CO2 sequestration. And I'm not lying, I could go on for about an hour and a half talking about various <laughs> research projects, but I think Susie probably wants to ask another question. Yeah. So as you can see, people get very excited about seaweed. Um, and people often ask me, wow, so seaweed sucks up all, this, all these bad things that the environment has too much of, like, is seaweed farming going to solve ocean acidification? And I say, unfortunately <laughs> not. No. Um, so Keith, I was wondering if you could just describe your farm a little bit and talk about the scale and the size and also the seasonality of your, of, of your kelp farm business and how that fits into the rest of your fishing business. You know, <clears throat> well, presently I have one, two, th three other partners involved, plus four other workers. Um, we have three large fields that are four acres apiece, and then I have, no, actually four large fields that are four acres apiece, and we have what we call an LPA, which is two lines that are 800 feet long, separated apart. So in the water, roughly, we have somewhere between 30 and 35,000 feet of rope when we're at the peak of the season. And we are right in the middle of the lobster territory. We are. And we're, we run about 35 feet of water where we are. And there is extreme amount of wild kelp where we are also. And we only run our lines when the lobstermen are not there. We have to, this is a winter project, winter product. And uh, we're done fishing in there about end of October and then we start running lines when the fishermen pick up and we finished up the product the first week in June this year and then the fishermen, I've already started setting my traps up in that area and now the fishermen will start to fish back in there. But what else would you? <clears throat> no, I th I th Go ahead. You have a really cool factor about your lease, Keith, that you made yourself that when your you, your lines are out, people can fish. Right, right. In your lease area. That normally, if you have mussels or you have oysters, they take a 12-month period, and that's correct. We're only there six months, so the rest of the fishermen, when the fishing season's on at the height of it, we're not giving up anything to the fishermen. Um, they can go wherever they want to go. We have to leave our moorings out, but it's no problem for them to fish around the moorings, but we're trying to expand. We're, we're getting there, slow but sure. The state of Maine is a little slow, but, <laughs> but we're gaining that's all. If they keep employees on and not fire them, we will be in pretty good shape. And, and it takes about, believe it or not, it takes sometimes almost four years to get a license, to get a permit. Can you tell yeah. people when those months are that the lines are out in the water? When are you? Yeah, we're, we're out from November to we start harvesting the 1st of May. 
and we got completely torn up. As you guys all know, the lovely Christmas storm that it blew so hard. Oh yeah, we, we got ripped up. We lost moorings. Um, we're, we're open to the southerly. Um, we're in very good shape to an easterly. There's usually more easterlies than there is southerlies, but we got nailed in that southerly before Christmas. And I think it hurt our product a lot because we, we broke a lot of lines and had to go replace them. And the product was already gone when we tried to replace them. But it's, it's always interesting out there. It's, it's a little more cut and dried than lobster and is. You understand what you're going to get at the end of the season and you're going to get something. Yeah. We tried something new this year too. When <clears throat> we had some loss from the December storm, we... We did. We added lines in December. Yep. We it, added. It wasn't, it wasn't bad. We, we come out of it not, not well, but we did gain. It was a gain. Yes. Better than zero. It was a lot better than zero. Yeah, well, we tried something new. <laughs> So some people might not understand what you mean by you added lines. Can you just describe what, <clears throat> where you get your seed and how you add yeah. lines? Okay, even all, of our, all of our seed comes from Liz from Atlantic Sea Farms. And what happened was when the lines broke off, it's so shallow there that they went down on the gravel bottom and it cleaned all the kelp off of the line. So the line was completely bare. And what we did was took those lines out and Liz sent us up some more um, product and we reseeded a new line into place and tried that. And uh, it did work. We, we had three lines that we did actually grow from December product and harvested in May and it did, it worked out. So we had a shorter growing season we did. than we ordinarily would. And the <clears throat> factor of the growing season is, is the amount of time that it can get sunlight while it's out there and water temperature. So when you shorten that amount of time, it means there's less photosynthesis happening, there's less growth happening. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that is great about our partnership is the fact that we give Keith the seed for free. So even though there was a loss that was of no account of his work, but mother nature, we still replace that seed for free again. Whereas if you were in another business like oysters or mussels and you lost your product, you would have to go then and buy more seed from your buyer, right? No one would say, here's some more free stuff. But that's what we do because we also then guarantee at the time of harvest, okay, whatever you grow, Keith, I'm gonna buy it. And I 100% guarantee that I'm gonna buy it before you outplant your farm. Yep. And so that's really hard to come by, I think in almost all farming, terrestrial, and in aquaculture. <clears throat> so it's really the marriage of how both of our businesses survive, is we rely on each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the agreement that works for us. Yep. So. so we've talked a little bit about the environmental benefits. We've talked a little bit about the economic diversification benefits. Um, I want to get to some of the nutritional benefits. But first, so that's a question for you, Liz. But first, I'd like you to share with the audience a little bit more. You guys make food. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about Atlantic Sea Farms, what you, what you turn that kelp into, and then some of the nutritional benefits of your products? Happy to. So I mentioned before that we're multiple businesses in one, and it comes down to our supply network where we have a whole state-of-the-art nursery. Our facility is based in Biddeford, Maine. So we're a Maine-based company. There are 23 full-time year-round employees that work there. We all go to work every day. None of us are remote. Uh, we all work in an open office. We have no cubicles. We see each other every day. Our sales team, our CEO, our operations team that works in our production facility. So once we get all the harvested kelp from Keith, I show up in a box truck and we load these thousand pound bags you kind of saw in the video people packing. Those go into the truck and then we drive them down to Bitterford. They go into our production facility and this is within like a two day time frame. And we make an array of products that are value added products. And I mean that in the way that when an oyster comes out of the water, it has a high value. You can buy it right from the dock, take it home, not even take it home, you could shuck it right there in the dock and eat it and that's what you would be meant to enjoy. Seaweed's not exactly the same. You need to zhuzh it up a little bit to really enjoy the flavor. And that's where we add the value, we add that market. So 
we started out really in just direct wholesale to chefs and people that wanted to bring it into a kitchen and work on it themselves. And that was pre-pandemic. When the pandemic hit, all of those restaurants and wholesale buyers shut their doors. But we still showed up to the dock and bought all the kelp because that's what we guaranteed to do as a business. And that really made us get into a state of agility where we had to find a different outlet for our products and we created a retail brand. And so from that, we are now in 1,700 stores nationwide from California to Hawaii and in your local Hannaford. And what products you can find are a, um, are a series of sea veggie burgers, two different flavors, and they're not meant to be a alternative meat. They're meant to be a seaweed burger. They're a different flavor. What do you think, Keith, of the burgers? They're very good. My wife, they're in the freezer at home. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> because you, you didn't love kelp at first. No. You know, no. it takes, it takes a little a bit, you know? It is. But yeah. we have some sea veggie burgers that you can find on the shelf. We have four different types of fermented seaweed products, and we have a whole fermentation production facility in our one, biz in our one building in Biddeford. And <clears throat> those products are a seaweed salad, a, uh, a spicy gochujang seaweed salad, which is a new product. It's my new favorite. Um, so look for that one at Hanford's a sea beet kraut, and a sea chi, which is a play on a kimchi. Um, we're really looking to use traditional recipes where seaweed is the culinary aspect in Asia primarily. And that's the other reason that we went to food first, is that 98% of all the seaweeds that we consume in the US are imported from overseas. But we have this clean, cold, beautiful water and this highly trained, skilled workforce that has the equipment you already had a boat when you showed up, right? You already knew how to tie the knots, you have the crew, and you have the social license to be on the water. And that really is the biggest thing. Your business was already there before you started seaweed farming. And so this is just an addition to Keith's portfolio of what he can do on the water. And that is really where, you know, the kelp in Maine has this huge potential. And um, kind of, I forgot about the other products that we have, but we still have um, three different smoothie cubes that we do. We partner with other New England-based businesses in order to make those flavors. So we work with Wyman's Blueberries. We have a blueberry and ginger kelp cube. And then we work with Ocean Spray and have a cranberry kelp cube. And what we do with them is we actually use the seeds from the cranberries because they're a byproduct. So originally Ocean Spray was discarding them, but the seeds are really high in fiber. So they're great for you too when you're having your smoothie. And some of those nutritional benefits, I mean, seaweed has vitamins A, or kelp I should say, has vitamins A through D. There's a healthy source of iodine. You're getting some trace amounts of protein. There are other seaweeds, green seaweed, sea lettuce that have higher amounts of protein, but it's really something that's great for your gut health too when you have a fermented product. So there are a lot of nutritional benefits and it's probably the most carbon neutral food item that you could eat. So like we're saying, seaweed's not gonna be the silver bullet. It's not gonna fix everything. But it's a better choice to eat seaweed than it is to eat soy when you're comparing that carbon footprint of the product that you're consuming. And it's even better because it comes from Maine and it's even better because it comes from Keith. And so, <laughs> That's really <clears throat> that food chain right there. So that's where we have our whole operations team, food safety, quality assurance. We have a sales and marketing division. Uh, we have our supply team and uh, our whole farmer network, which is 30 farmers up and down the coast. Say, how many you got to get yeah, now? Wow. 30 all the way from yeah. Eastport through Casco Bay. Yep. Um, yeah, and growing rapidly. So you have 23 uh, employees in Biddeford mm -hmm. and then 30 partner farmers mm -hmm. and I want to ask you a little bit more later but I'll give you a little break um, don't let me forget to get back to this but I want to ask you about what type of jobs you provide in Biddeford um, but first Keith I want to go back to you and ask you what it's been like for you you fish and farm out of Spruce Head mm -hmm. what it's 
been like? You were, you were <coughs> one of the, the first to farm kelp in Maine. Um, and I'm just curious, has it caught on? Have you, what is the feedback that you get when you, when you leave the dock? Or yeah, when you come back from the dock with your product? I believe it has. It, it's slow getting people to introduce to it. Um, there's, there's been more probably participation the last year or two with farmers calling me. There's been a couple of them down east. I believe they're still going to keep going, right? They're Randy in Duke it. Him, okay. They're but, in it. Um, they, they look to be going big scale. The, the worst part of the whole detail was, though, is there was nobody to go back to when you made a mistake. Nobody. You had to learn on your own. Believe me, we made a lot of mistakes. We just did. We um, lost a lot of kelp by lines tangling up, and that was our worst problem, and also with securing moorings. When we're still having a problem with that with the severe storms. Mm -hmm. um, they break. They, they won't hold up. And you can picture it different, but the boats are up in a safe harbor, and these are right out in the middle of the ocean, basically, and they're in shallow water where if it's a storm, it gets really rough and it breaks. And of course, we go out and everything is broke. <laughs> so we have to repair it, but we have learned a lot about how to repair it. And we just have a whole organization of extra moorings. We pour concrete moorings on shore. And my friend, one of them has an open stern boat, and he can carry four of them at one time. So we just cut them out and hook them back up. And the, there's three of us that are also divers. So when the moorings get broke off and the water gets nice and warm, we will go down and dive and find all those moorings and secure them back up and bring them back up. Because we're only in 25 or 30 feet of water, most of it which seems to be the best growing kelp, isn't it really? Where you are, for sure. Yeah. People down south are realizing that as water temperature rises, having a little deeper, bit more, going deeper. more depth yeah. allows you a longer growing season. <clears throat> yeah. Water temperatures change at different rates and different depths. Yeah, so it is. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna, this year we're gonna grow a native kelp, aren't we? Well, we always grow native kelp, but, but we're going mean, to grow native to Wheeler's to area, Bay. Right to, right to Wheeler's Bay. We're going to go right to Wheeler's Bay. And try it. And we're going to get mm -hmm. seed stock no. for kelp, for Keith's farm, from his farm, okay. essentially, at this point. And we yep. grow uh, sugar and skinny kelp, which are both native to Maine. Yep. Everything is sourced in the state and is locally to the farms. Right, yeah. But we've just realized that you have so many people and interest in your bay that we need to go right to the source. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sugar grows very well there. Sugar does. So we're going to put in more sugar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. It doesn't get more, lo more local than that. Uh, Miller's Bay kelp. Yep. That's awesome. And it tastes good too. Oh. Yes, it does. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's obvious that we all care about kelp and seaweed, and you all care enough that you're here. Uh, Nicole, <coughs> I was wondering if you could tell us, why does Congress care about seaweed? <laughs> Congress has started paying attention. So in 2019, they passed a bill to organize an interagency working group. That means all the federal agencies, the federal funding agencies that support research were charged to come together and discuss the state of seaweed farming science in the U.S. as well as seagrass restoration efforts. Um, they formed the committee, but there weren't funds released or appropriated until 2021 to support the effort. And at that point, the United States Department of Agricultural, Agricultural Resource, Research Services group reached out to me to contract me and Bigelow to help prepare a report on the state of science on seaweed in the US. So we have been, for the past couple of years, and again this coming summer, been organizing listening sessions for people from every aspect of the sector, from other researchers like myself, from industrial uh, or commercial farmers and growers and processors and harvesters and um, <coughs> the, the folks who add value add products during the processing stage to distribution. Everybody that's involved with the process has been 
enjoying these listening sessions and contributing their thoughts to the report. So the report should be fairly comprehensive. Um, we are in the process of trying to keep it from being 200 pages and putting it down into something that's readable, about 30 pages. It'll be released in 2024. The purpose of this report is to help identify where we have major knowledge gaps or policy shortages really, really for the, the country that could help um, guide the industry as it moves forward to ensure its sustainability in face of a growing global market for seaweed, never mind just the growing industry at the U.S. And truth be told, our grow rate of growth in the U.S. is slower than most other countries in terms of the investment that those countries are making in research and development of um, selective breeding ideas about how to get the best seed sources, about new processing techniques, or even investing in companies that develop the processing equipment. That can be pretty hard to find when you want to scale up production of, of seaweed for humans or for feed or for bioplastics or whatever. So we're hoping this report will be really influential. And um, I invite everyone to consider coming to our listening sessions. There's uh, save the dates that we can send out. Also, if you are interested in learning any more specifically about seaweed as livestock feed, I'll be offering a Cafe Scientifique event at Bigelow on August 15th in the evening. So it's going to be about an hour, 45 minute, hour long lecture with Q&A afterwards to tell you about how our $10 million funded research from the USDA on this issue is progressing. We're in year two of a five-year project, and we have some real new hopeful avenues that I'd love to share with you. And maybe my last thought on this is um, when I was finishing graduate school, my advisor said, well, how are you going to sell yourself as a scientist? What are you going to call yourself? A marine ecologist? A coral reef ecologist? And I was like, well, what about a phycologist? Someone who studies seaweed. He goes, Pfft. Don't, don't do that. You'll just, you, there's no future in seaweeds. <laughs> I, I, I just love to see the look on his face now with all that we're doing. Nice. I, yeah, I would say there's definitely a future for seaweed. Yeah. Um, and I, I have two more questions for the panel, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, one of the ones that, so we've, we've talked about a lot of positive topics today, and there are a lot more we could talk about, but I was hoping that each of you, um, unless it becomes redundant, could talk about what you see as some of the barriers or bottlenecks facing the growth of seaweed in Maine, and maybe where we could be doing better and how we could be more supportive. I don't know who wants to start. I'll leave it up to you guys. Go ahead, Liz. Sure. <laughs> so I think... One of the things that's happening in the state right now is that the interest in seaweed farming is from fishermen, I'm seeing, is really high. And there's a, a want to diversify. There's a want to maintain your heritage on the water and to provide for your family, right? And to do what you've always done. And in order to do that through seaweed farming, you have to get a lease from the state of Maine. And the reason that Keith was saying earlier it takes about four years is because the process is very rigorous. And it's rigorous for the right reasons. The regulations are strong. They're some of the strongest in the entire country and even in the world. So that way people are coming to Maine and saying, this is a model that we want to employ in our industry to see it grow successfully and to be robust. And the reason that it's taking four years is really because we need some more staff. It takes a very highly trained and qualified person to do this job, and we want those people. We want to maintain a high standard of quality for food, for safety on the water, for the social license <coughs> of people that belong there and have always been there. And in order to do that, we need the people that process those leases to have good wages, to have a healthy work-life balance, because we all deserve that. And it's hard to do that when the number of staff is the <coughs> same today as it was five years ago. And the amount of leases that have been applied for has increased, I think at this point, we're almost at a tenfold increase. Because, they are, because we don't have that diversification of other fisheries in the way that we always used to, like Keith was talking about. So 
my area that I would say would be <coughs> additional staffing for the Department of Marine Resources in order for everyone to be able to do the job that they want to show up and do. And what we need there is we need some additional appropriations at a state level to have funding to support those people. <coughs> and we also need to work in a, in a factual science-based environment. And that's really important. And I think that all of us here are, you know, feel very passionate about that as well. Um, <coughs> but for the potential for the markets, the market is there. We could use seaweed in so many different ways outside of food, and we are exploring those ways. But the only way to be in those markets is to have the seaweed. <coughs> and the only way to have the seaweed is to have the leases for Keith and others like him to farm on successfully. And I think one of the last thing I'll say to that <coughs> is that, you know, your fields are producing a lot of kelp, but the footprint overall of aquaculture in the state of Maine is less than zero. 0.04% of the Gulf of Maine. The footprint of aquaculture is extremely small. All the leases that are granted and active right now could fit in the Portland jet port and there'd be room to spare. I know almost everybody here has been there and if you haven't, it's probably the smallest airport that you'll go to unless you're going to an island, like a very small island. So um, it's productive, it's strong. Maine is a great example and we have a great seafood brand. You go to Chicago and you get a Maine lobster. I want it to say Maine kelp also. So that's the bottleneck, but also my goal. <clears throat> I would say just my goal is production. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's into the sales part of it. She's into the promotion part of it. And I look at how can I max my production out? Um, we, we would like to be able to raise in two years, 300,000 pounds. And that's all, that's, a goal we've set, the group of us. I think we can do it. <clears throat> sure you can. Yep. If anyone can, it's you. <laughs> we <gonna> try. <laughs> yeah. If we can get our expansion, that's all, and that's come slow. No, we understand. And there's, I don't think people lot, there is public hearings involved with this. Um, I have to go through two public hearings before it finally gets finalized. But we haven't really stated the. I, I can state if when you first start out, you start out with an LPA, which is a very small portion. It's a couple of lines, 800 feet long. And then we've advanced to what they call an experimental lease, which is four acres and as many lines as you can put into it. And now we're at the point where an experimental lease is only good for three years. And after that point, we have to bring it into a standard lease that's just permanent. And that's where my process is right now, bringing them into standard leases, which is permanent, either 10 or 20 year lease. And that's when people become involved because that is a long time on that ocean, a 20 year lease, and people want to make sure it's right. And so that's where we are. So we have to have two public hearings for each, uh, for each lease. How many people have you talked to, Keith? about this before we even submitted the paperwork? Oh, Augusta probably five or six. And then your town's involved and the harbor master's involved and the marine patrol's involved and the scientist divers are involved. So we could probably be here all night with the list. And there's probably a few yeah. more there that's yeah. involved. Yeah. So, yeah. I think so. there's close to two dozen, two dozen Federal and state agencies that get involved for each yeah. lease application, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's got to be. And I forgot about the, yeah, the... Um, the Army Corps. Army Corps. Because you, you also to, have to engage with them. You've got to engage the Army Corps of Engineers. We have to send them a, a picture of what we're going to do. Each, each, what, each final standard lease was what, 40 pages? Those were the short ones. <laughs> yeah. 40 pages. So it's a process. It's not, they just don't just give them out. No. They don't just give them out, no. <laughs> Nicole, did you have anything you wanted to add before my final question and then we open it up to the audience? Two very quick answers, two bottlenecks and two ways we're addressing them through science. One bottleneck is, or, or potential issue, is that seaweed's a really good sponge, which means it sometimes takes up the bad parts of what's in the ocean environment. So it can take up heavy metals 
It can take up contaminants that we don't want to be eating or feeding to our animals. <coughs> the bottleneck is finding the appropriate testing facilities to ensure the safety of the tissue. The, the issue is you can send the same sample, sometimes even just for iodine, to two different labs that ensure you that they're the best at it and you get two very different answers for that same <coughs> sample. Sometimes, depending on the lab, you can even send that same sample to the lab twice and still get two different <laughs> answers. So how are we addressing this issue? The National Institute of Science and Technology, one of these federal agencies that is involved, NIST, has hosted a round robin where labs could choose to participate and compare themselves to each other anonymously. But everybody got sent the exact same sample of uh, sugar kelp, actually, seaweed tissue, and did the same analysis on it to see if they could all come up with the same numbers. And then you get your own scorecard and you know how well you're faring. And as a purveyor of seaweed, you can send the sample to them and ask, hey, did you participate in that round robin? Could you tell me how you did? And if they don't answer that question, you have your answer <laughs> pretty much. But they should be able to answer and say, yeah, and we did this well, we, we scored here. So that allows everybody a better sense of security about the quality of the product. The other bottleneck is warming. Yes, seaweed may be part of the solution to address it, but it's not infallible to the warming problem. And we do have growing evidence of along the Australian coast and along our own coast, seaweeds changing their distribution. And as you were mentioning earlier, the farms in the southern part of the state need to be grown in deeper waters so they can stay cooler. We see wild populations of seaweeds disappearing from the southern part of the state and being more um, staying <coughs> abundant in the northern part of the state. How are we going to use seaweed farming to help address that issue? One of the things that Bigelow is also working on is developing cryopreservation or deep freeze tools for the spores or the microscopic stage of seaweed so that if we are fearful about losing some of these endemic <coughs> or truly native only to Maine populations, do we have a place where we can preserve its biodiversity and preserve seed to be used on farms in the future? So those are two bottlenecks, safety of the product itself and safety of the future generations and Bigelow's trying to address both of them. That's it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end with this question I've just been dying to get Liz to talk about. I've never been so excited about a jar labeler and this like idea of mechanization ever before. Uh, but we were at a meeting together, was it yesterday? Yesterday in, somehow. Yeah, in Belfast uh, with a group of colleagues um, trying to come up with a roadmap for Maine's seafood economy. So something pretty easy. Um, and um, we were in a, a discussion together and Liz told this story, and I'm going to ask you to tell it again, but the reason why I'm asking you to tell it is not specifically to talk about a machine that puts labels on jars, but about the importance of year-round employment and benefits and um, careers. And I think that in some, in some communities, we romanticize the, the small-scale business and the mom and pop businesses and maybe forget about some of the seasonality and the hardship that might go along with that type of business model. And so I was just wondering if you could describe the efforts of your company, um, which is a small company and a main based company to provide people with careers and year round employment and benefits and meaningful work and how that relates to the jar label labeler, if that fits in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. So this September will be my three year anniversary working at Atlantic Sea Farms. And when I started, I was the sixth employee. And now we have 23 employees. And we were originally in a building that was 5,000 square feet. And it was a sad building. We shared it with a bunch of different other companies. It was, you know, uh, every space was a shared space. So our nursery space, when it wasn't in seed production in the fall, was a storage, was broken down and was a storage area for other things. And now we are in a 27,000 square foot space with all these employees. And 
if when I started, uh, you know, you had asked me where do you see the company, I would not have said that this is where we would be. But the reason that we're here is because of all of the innovations from things like DAR labelers, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but the amount of labor and the cost of goods, which we call COGS uh, in, in our production facility, you know, when you, your COGS are really high, it means that your product on the shelf is really high and it means that people don't want to buy it, especially when it's seaweed and they don't know, what do I do with this thing? Why am I going to spend $10 on something I don't know how to use or know if I'm going to like it? But by having machinery that does specific jobs that are jobs, they're not careers, they're not something that propels a person to feel fulfilled by doing every day and showing up and feeling like they're having an impact. So by having things like a jar labeler, we also got a jar tightener, which doesn't sound fancy or sexy or, or anything interesting, but has made it so that way all of the employees that we had prior to these, this equipment now have careers at Atlantic Sea Farms that are full-time, that are year-round, that are meaningful, where they're able to be part of the innovation process for our new products. They're able to come up with more creative solutions and use their brain power in more efficient ways to propel our company and to continue to grow. We have never really been at a place where, we, where each employee didn't work in every different department. We all were jack of all trades. You know, during harvest season, we had a warehouse manager that was also driving trucks, you know, like, but they belong at the warehouse, but they couldn't be because we just didn't have enough people. Now everybody has a role and a function to the point that we are able, we just hired a VP of growth. We just hired a chief finance officer. We just hired a VP of operations. We actually are having meaningful careers that are going to propel the seafood industry in a way that has economic benefits that are, that are huge. I mean, it means that I can do my job and I can actually bring on new farmers and that impact of working with people like Keith goes from working with three farmers to now 30 to maybe in the future, who knows how many. And that's really the mission of Atlantic Sea Farms. It is to drive impact back to our coastal communities and so that way working waterfronts can be preserved and exist the way that Maine is and the reasons that we love to live here. You know, quality of life is really high. I've been feeling really fortunate lately, uh, especially in the past two weeks, knowing what air quality has been like in other places and forest fires. And, you know, we haven't had that impact here. It's been pretty eye-opening and humbling. And I think that living here is special. And by having more meaningful jobs and careers at the place that I work, that is main-based, is really valuable and it, it's a small business. Like we are a very small business doing big things and that's powerful too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so it is 8.04 and the program goes until 8.30 and I wanted to leave the rest of the time for audience questions. So please feel free to raise, well, raise your hands. Okay, we'll start at the front right here and I'll move my way back. <laughs> I'll, you, you can say the question and I'll repeat it so everyone can hear. Okay, um, I don't know a lot about seaweed uh, reproduction and life cycle, so like, what is the life cycle in reproduction of seaweed and how does it interact with the wild stock that you're farming here? Okay, so the question was about the reproductive life cycle of seaweeds For and kelp. Uh, of kelp and how it interacts with wild populations of kelp. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, we have the scientists here. Yeah. Scientists all over I think the, place. the technical term is a bipartite life cycle, which <laughs> means that it has two life phases. Um, actually, it has a several. It's complicated. I'm really glad you narrowed it down to kelp, too, because lots of series have different <laughs> phases. So the simplest way is to take your whole leaf kelp that you see, and when it goes reproductive, it has a dark strip that goes up the middle. That's the sorus tissue where new spores are forming. Those spores get released. And believe it or not, those <coughs> suckers can swim. They have a flagella that makes them move around. And honestly, they look a lot like sperm underwater. <laughs> they find a place to attach. They stick. And whether you know it or not, you can't see it at this stage, but there's a male version and a female version. 
and then they grow up and the male actually does release sperm and the female releases an egg. That has formal sexual reproduction <coughs> to form the adult stage again. The question though that you asked is a really important one. How does the farmed kelp impact the wild population? And this is one of the reasons why general policies, Atlantic Sea Farm's own homegrown policy, but a state of Maine policy and an Alaska state policy, is you need to collect your brood stock from the place where you're going to grow the seaweed anyways, <coughs> so that you don't have any effect on that local population. The interest now, though, is in being able to selectively breed for certain traits like <coughs> temperature tolerance. And this is happening in lots of other places in the world. It's not happening quite yet in the US. There are scientists researching it, but it's not entered the commercial industry. I think alongside that desire to do selective breeding for certain traits is also a desire to create infertile forms of the seaweed. So when you're growing it on the farm, it cannot interact, genetically speaking, with the wild population. So those are some concerns that are being addressed at a scientific level right now. First, we have to understand what's the genetic diversity that's out there. Are we being overly sensitive to a problem that doesn't exist? Is there so much diversity that, that you could take a population from Saco Bay and put it in Penn Bay? It's all the same population anyways. That's one line of research that's trying to help answer this question. And another line is, can you create an infertile version of the alga? Kind of like oysters. Yeah. Which is what? Just like oysters. Almost everybody does yeah. when they farm oysters. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep, right here. Can you, can you, uh, first of all, are the lines on the bottom when you, uh, or are they floating in the water? No, sir. They're seven feet under the surface, horizontal. Okay, so you could, so they, uh, I was on a planning board in Bremen, and still had, and we yep. had uh, people fly for permits. Anyway, um, the thought was that in order to counteract the, uh, uh, the carbonic acid from too much CO2 in the water uh, to grow uh, sea, uh, sugar kelp mm -hmm. underneath the oyster uh, farm mm -hmm. in order to just, you know, in that local area to reduce it. And so I was just curious about that. Um, <coughs> and, uh, so, are you saying that the seeding that you're bringing seeds from elsewhere in, or are you trying, or you have to use seeds from the local kelp? Because when I was growing up in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, and going lobster fishing in Casco Bay, we used to get huge sheets of kelp when we pulled up lines of traps, and then that seemed to become reduced. And then, how much? How many different kinds of seaweed do we have? Because like rockweed, um, and then uh, regulatory, um, are there licenses required for people? Because I've seen people go around and harvest at low tide off of people's rocks, and who should people call to say, hey, somebody's stealing my, the rockweed off of my rocks. <coughs> um, and then like Suzuki's up in Rockland, they serve seaweed salad and stuff that they get locally. Yep. But the thing is, is that um, <clears throat> if you've got to have a license, you know, is there poaching, a lot of poaching that's, um, I mean, you know, maybe not still from you, but from, from yep. other places. Okay, so that, uh, I'm just going to repeat some of those questions. Yeah. There was <laughs> four there. So the first one was around the benefits of co locating kelp with a shellfish, in this case, oysters. Um, Nicole and I have worked on the, the benefits of co-locating co farmed kelp with farmed mussels. And so I'll ask you, yeah, why don't you touch on that? And then we can get into the local seed, which we've kind of already hit on. And then we can get into the, the rockweed, which we won't spend a lot of time on because we could have a whole, that's, that's not aquaculture, so. I mean, this whole topic is a Hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So why don't we why don't you talk about co-location and pros and cons of various um, pairings? Sure. So that's really where Susie and I started working together was first figuring out if kelp can create a better water quality or a halo effect around the farm, and then 
which species of shellfish could you grow with kelp to feel the benefit of that halo effect? And our interest started really with oysters because it was um, a little bit more prevalent as a growing industry <coughs> in Maine at the time, and kelp. And then we realized pretty quickly that the seven feet below the surface where you're gonna grow your kelp lines in colder, clearer water offshore wasn't actually where you wanted to grow your oysters. It was maybe in the same location you want to grow your blue mussels. And so that's why we started looking at that pair specifically together. And we did an experiment where we took mussels on a rope from a nearby farm, nearby, same bay, and placed it inside a kelp farm and then at distances increasingly further away from that kelp farm to see if you could directly um, correlate or, or see the effect of the farm on the mussels that were grown inside it. And what we found was that those mussels had harder, thicker shells that were more resistant to cracking, which supports the hypothesis that the kelp is creating this halo of better water quality for those mussels to form harder, thicker shells. They might also be eating some of the kelp detritus that's coming off of the farm and helping them physiologically that way. And so we're still sorting out those details. But to answer your question, yes, you can see that effect, but you've got to think very carefully about which seaweed species you're going to pair with which shellfish and which habitats are the best for each of them to grow in simultaneously. And then the, the answer to the seed question we, we talked about earlier does have to be locally sourced. Um, and then and I have a license. I have to have a permit in right. order to collect that stock material also. So I have to have a permit to collect just for research purposes as well. We have tons of permits, I think, between all of us <laughs> on this stage. So, yeah. You need yeah. a permit in order to, to collect uh, rockweed? Yes, but I don't think any of us are... Uh, we don't work in the wild harvest sector. Well, <clears throat> you have there's experiences with some of the research. Can you touch on that briefly, yeah. Nicole? That is like a, that's that's a that's a whole different topic. And Nicole, do you want to say a sentence or two? Just very briefly, that yes, you need a license. That the people who have been harvesting rockweed in the state of Maine for 30, 40 plus years have good relationships with the landowners where they harvest, and they value that crop even more than any of you sitting in this audience. I can promise you that they take great care to collect only 11 inches above where the holdfast is to leave behind growing tissue to reform that rockweed bed and to make sure that they don't threaten the future generations. It can stay like that for a year to three years before it's fully grown back and they go back to harvest. But they are collecting a small fraction of what is along the entire coast. And if you're really interested in that kind of stuff, Bigelow has a partner research program with another group to use drone technology to come over rockweed beds and get a quick biomass estimate, rel quick relative to somebody trudging out there and making measurements by hand to, to help better manage that resource in the state. Another fun fact, when rockweed grows back, it grows back bushier than if you hadn't harvested it. And there's a lot of remaining questions that we have about whether that increased productivity after harvesting actually can add to further carbon dioxide removal and carbon sequestration than had you not managed that rockweed bed through harvest. There are bycatch questions, and if you're interested in that, you can visit the CRASH, C-A-R-A, a S H program to learn more about what rockweed removal does or doesn't do to the environment. But it is a very permitted and regulated process in the US. We have the largest amount of biomass that you have to leave behind in the world. Most countries don't regulate it all. You can scrape it off. Canada, I think, says seven inches. George is in the audience and he's going to correct me. And then Maine says at least 11 inches have to be left behind. So it's actually quite well regulated. It's kind of like our lobsters, yeah. where we have the maximum, the minimum, all the regulations. Yeah. Okay. Question over here. Uh, you mentioned something that sounds just like it's easy and mechanical about seeding and reseeding lines. How, what, what's the mechanics of doing that? Okay, <clears throat> actually we didn't reseed the line. 
when we got all done, we took the line out of the process and we put in a new line and we seated the new line and attached it in. How do you seat the line at the beginning? Well, we have a, they set us up with a three, what's that about, a three foot PVC tube, two inches. They wrap it with seed line and that's what they grow their spores on in the lavatory. And it's real, real, real small nylon twine and we run our rope through the center of the PVC tube, tie it off, and when the line goes through the center of the PVC tube, you pull it the other way, and it'll just gradually wrap uh, that twine onto our main rope. Very good process, very easy. No? We just have to make sure we do in any way that we don't touch the tubes, uh, knock the spores off of the tubes, and they've even come up with a way where all the tubes fit inside of a lobster crate now, and we can actually store it for two to three days before we even put it on. And that's a great help, that really is. It helps when the weather's nice too, right? It does, <laughs> so it, 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 before we used to have to put it on daily. Whatever day they bring up the tubes, we had to put it on that day, and now we can wait for better weather and put it on when it's great out there. A question right there. Yep. So, yep. So, optimal sighting for a kelp farm. How how far out into the ocean, or we, or more precisely, probably what at what depth? We're we're in about 25 to 30 feet of water, and we're exactly 1,000 feet from land, because we have to stay 1,000 feet from land, or we come under the owners of the properties jurisdiction. So we try to stay 1,000 feet away from land. So we're pretty close to shore. Question Can I just add to that? Wait, one sec. Go ahead, Nicole. Just to add to that, you know, that's for coastal growing of kelp. There has been a lot of money invested at a federal level, level to look into offshore culture of kelp too, oh. way offshore. And there are projects. Um, there's maybe one technically is an offshore lease in California, it's still in the EEZ, but there are people interested in growing kelp way out in the ocean as well. Um, there's lots of considerations and issues about that, but you can technically grow kelp anywhere. That is the common practice for our coast in Maine. And for the permitting, I think permitting. that's the other thing too. Like when we say that your lease is coastal and it's inshore, we're dealing just with our state agencies in order to do that yeah. permitting. Once you pass three miles, then you're offshore, and that's a federal permitting process. And that's what Nicole's talking about in California, where they're in federal water. So that is like a one of a kind for the country. And none of that is happening in Maine. And I mean, really for the farmers that are doing it, it would be, it would be so much more expensive for fuel, for anchoring, and just the feasibility. How do you attach it? How do you, attach it? How do you check on it? on a regular basis, you know, there's so yeah, much to very it. Very expensive. Yeah. Question over here. Thank you. It's been very interesting. I'm just curious, are other types of seaweeds being farmed here in Maine? So are other types of seaweeds being farmed in Maine? There are 250 species of seaweed along <laughs> our coast, and so <coughs> we're not tackling all of those, but there's actually several kelp species that are getting grown. There's the sugar kelp, the skinny kelp, winged kelp or Ilaria, Laminaria digitata. There's some other species that may become interesting in the future. Um, there's some red species of seaweed that could be thought about growing those in Maine. They are summer species, and so they sort of disrupt that model of removing the gear to allow recreational fishermen or commercial fishermen to come in in the summer to the same shared space. And so when we start thinking about red species, often people think about moving from ocean culture instead to land-based culture to avoid those issues and to do some better temperature regulation of their needs. But there's a world of possibility out there. We are looking at diversifying into other species because, I mean, diversity, diversity, diversity in our fisheries, in our aquaculture, in the species that we grow. And those are all native because we have so many valuable ones too. Yeah. There's also different markets that those can feed into and different variables <laughs> that um, would support 
you know, different human foods and bioplastics and things like that. So hopefully more to come in the future. Yeah. There's a couple of questions uh, right here in the back row. Uh, so just to, well, I'd like to quickly address the, the brain uh, person's question about the rock wheat. There is a main Supreme Court case on that from like 2018, 2015, right around there. Um, yep. Thanks for the question. So, so basically the question was the difference between what, what Keith has an experimental lease, how big can that be, how big can a standard lease be, and then what type of, uh, I think it's 20 acres, is that right, for a standard? No, well, unlimited. Unlimited? No. Okay. <laughs> and then the, Sorry. Second, the second part of the question was... <laughs> I got some facts. When you can go. How, big, how big can you go standard? So the permitting that exists with the state, you can get a... there. The limit for standard, and I'll say standard leases are all the species that you can grow. So I'm not talking just seaweeds, I'm talking mussels, I'm talking scallops, I'm talking oysters, we're talking fish, we're talking seaweeds. It's a, it's a blanket. So in the state, you can get a 100 acre oh, lease. God, there is nobody that I know that operates on a 100 acre lease that is south of, you know, Penobscot Bay South and anything other than finfish, and that's because that size is required to grow those organisms in a healthy environment. I am no fish expert, but I will talk to seaweeds. There is nobody that I know that operates on larger than a 20-acre lease site, and I don't even think the person that has that lease site utilizes the full potential of the space. Keith, yours that you applied for, we did 11. 11. 11 yep. acres because that's all you need yep. to be productive to the scale yeah. that, you know, a, a small scale business can do, right? That's the max I can do. That's the max. Mm -hmm. And that's like the equipment, the boats, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so although our state has a range of sizes, it doesn't mean that we are grasping to get the max of everything. We're working in the amount that we need in order to be productive. I think it's really important to put that into perspective also. It's really important to put it into perspective. So the lease sizes in other states in the U.S. make these look like postage stamps. Mm -hmm. They are tiny compared to what we are seeing in other states. And this model is working pretty well for Maine, that there's a few, uh, th there's small lease areas, but there's many of them that gives lots of fishermen opportunities to partake in the process instead of having one big company come in and, st and set up a large lease that they man manage. It's working well for Maine. Because, I mean, you own your lease. It's in your name. It's not in my name. It's not in Atlantic Sea Farm's <laughs> name. I mean, we don't own a single seaweed farm, but we're a seaweed company. Everything is owner operated, and that's built off the lobster model because it's a successful model, and that's what we as a state and as a group of individuals that live here have decided that works. That's what we like. That's how we want to see grow and shape the rest of our coastline. So I think it works great, but like you're saying, in Alaska, 100 acre lease is like, yeah, okay, whatever. 100 acre lease, yeah, whatever. I mean, actually, the state of Alaska has just infused, I think it's up to $10 million to grow their mariculture industry simply for food security, for additional careers, for more infrastructure, for a higher population, all things, you know, there are certain elements of that that Maine is also looking for too. And um, we're just doing it in a very different way. I see so many more questions. I'm so sorry, but we are about out of time. I will say, so we have five minutes left. Christina, I know I was supposed to uh, let you come back up onto the stage and thank our panelists. 
Bill, I'm not sure if you were coming up onto the stage. So I don't <coughs> want to cut us off early. It's 8.25. We're supposed to end at 8.30. There's like a million more questions. One thing I can say is that we're going to do something like this again. The Island Institute is hosting events like this two more times this summer. The next one is June 29th, and the next one after that is August 4th, 3rd, August 3rd. Um, it will be a different panel, but they're all talks about aquaculture in Maine. So if you didn't have your question answered today, you could either try to catch up with one of us after the panel or attend um, the next event or two. Christina, did you want to say anything before I thank the panelists? I was just going to go over dates and thank everybody. You did. Thank you so much. I think, I think we're all set. Bill, did you want to say anything? You sort of covered exactly my commercial that I was going to give. The, the only uh, other component that I would ask is I want to thank uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight for this experience. But I especially want to thank those of you that are members of the Island Institute. Uh, if you aren't a member, and to continue this conversation, going to islandinstitute.org is a great way to be able to continue what was started here this evening. There's membership information out in the lobby, uh, and we, we can also continue the conversation in two weeks on, on the 29th back here as uh, part of our series. Yeah. Part of our series. Great. Good night, thank everyone. So thank I'm going to sit down. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Liz. Thank